Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? I'm going to get you all in with a bad joke. Who knows why the cowboy got a dachshund? A dachshund. Little wiener dog. He wanted to get a long little doggy. I'm here all day, guys. Um, so welcome. My name, again, is Monica Pless. I am the new Agrarian Program Director for the Kivira Coalition. And a little quick background. I have been working on sustainable and organic diversified farms since 2004. But before then, my background is that I went to college on an ornithology scholarship. And so my passion for birds and bird conservation actually even predates my passion for farming and ranching. And so I am really delighted to have those two passions come together in this talk we're about to hear. Um, we're hearing from the Sage Grouse Initiative, which is a partnership-based, science-driven effort using voluntary incentives to proactively conserve America's western rangelands, wildlife, and rural way of life. The initiative is part of the Working Lands for Wildlife, which is led by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. We're going to be talking today about an example of some of their collaborative efforts from the Gunnison Basin in Colorado, where private par public partnerships have applied restoration techniques, including many pioneered by Bill Zedike. I'd like to introduce the folks up here on stage with me. We have Jeremy Meistis, who's a sagebrush ecosystem specialist in partnership with USDA NRCS, West National Technology Center in Portland, Oregon. We have Nathan Seward, the wildlife conservation biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife in Gunnison, Colorado. And we have Jim Cochran, who's a rancher at Wildcat Ranch and a private consultant with Cochran Fish and Wildlife Consulting in Powderhorn, Colorado. Please join me in welcoming our panel. All right, thanks, Monica. It's really exciting for us to be here with you today. Just listening to the first two speakers, I'm really inspired already. I'm a wildlife biologist by training, and I can tell you most of the conferences I go to are really boring and really narrowly focused. I love the breadth of the discussions and the thought process. When we were invited to come here, um, I wanted to think about how the Sage Grouse Initiative could be relevant to folks who may be working in entirely different ecosystems. And I think what you'll take home, hopefully, from our panel this morning is that there's a ton of transferability in how we're tackling uh, at-risk species problems. And when the previous speakers were talking about quality of life in agriculture, most of the polling that's done out there today identifies the Endangered Species Act and other species concerns as one of the top regulatory nightmares for agricultural producers. It, it is a source of uncertainty that you don't need. But it's not the critter's fault. The critters are telling us something's broken in the land and so this is a story, again, back to people. How do we get more people involved in not just stopping the bleeding, but regenerating the land and making it abundant and, and fruitful for wildlife as a true solution to our at-risk species conservation problems? We think we've tapped into a little bit of the secret sauce to doing that. And I'm going to share with you some of the big picture stuff and then step it down to a tangible example of this actually happening in a community in Colorado. So when we think about species regulatory uh, processes, we often think about these stroke of the pen policy changes where perhaps uh, all we need to do to recover uh, imperiled species is stop putting out a particular pesticide. Or maybe it's just stopping the harvest of alligators and all of a sudden we have a huge ribbon cutting ceremony success, right? The problem with that strategy is that most species 
are what we call conservation-reliant species. In fact, about 84% of all imperiled species not only require perhaps some surgical policy changes, they also require voluntary, proactive restoration and conservation, mostly by private landowners who occupy two-thirds of the U.S. and our public land managers in the West who steward those lands, landscapes. So we need both policy change and voluntary action as a solution to address the other 84% of species that are in trouble. In 2010, uh, USDA's NRCS that I work for, some of you may be familiar with that organization, We're, uh, we work almost in every county across the country. We're the only federal agency whose primary mission is to provide that technical and financial assistance to landowners in conservation and sustainable agriculture. We took a look at what we were doing as our business model for addressing at-risk species. We kept having crisis after crisis after crisis come up and impact agriculture, our folks. And we looked in the mirror and said, we actually have the ability with our resources, existing resources, to marshal them and focus them to help our rural communities address these problems. And when we did that, we had to look across the country and see where those gems of success have been to try to understand what were the ingredients, what was the secret sauce that motivated enough people to do enough things in the right places that species either no longer required uh, protection under the Endangered Species Act or were never listed in the first place. When we did that, here's the brief list we came up with. And we put this under the banner of what we call our Working Lands for Wildlife uh, effort. It's not a special program. There's no money behind it. It's a thought process and a packaging. In fact, we'd just as soon take the word wildlife out of it and talk about working lands, regenerative agriculture, whatever you want. This is how we're able to motivate voluntary private land conservation to solve some of these problems. And it first starts with trust and credibility. That is the first ingredient that we found as a prerequisite to success, and that's people living in the community, go to church, volunteer in the schools, and they're part of the fabric of that community that allows them to have conversations that might be difficult. That community-based grassroots approach and uh, an approach that invites cooperation over conflict is the first step. Second, a shared vision. Too often we lead with the critter, and it's all about the critter and what it needs. What we need to do is step back, and I love this, this holistic goal idea has got me thinking even bigger now, but perhaps that shared vision is, you know, what's in it for everyone? What is uh, the link between wildlife, agriculture, and when we have that, more people are willing to come under the banner and do good things. And then there's things like having a strategic approach. We need to work smarter, not harder. You've heard that. But it's true. We don't have endless resources, and so we need to be really highly targeted in where we're doing this work. We need to be accountable to the public who's entrusting us with resources um, to help make change happen. And so integrating the science on the front end to help focus where we work and on the back end to quantify the outcomes. What does it all mean? Leveraging. We, wanna, uh, we, we love the big tent approach. We want more people, hands, all hands, all lands approach to tackling these problems. And then the final ingredient is the fact that if somebody does something good, they can't be punished later for it. And so some predictability that if a landowner does good work, that we can create some regulatory predictability in their operation going forward. So the example we're going to share with you, which again, if you know nothing about sage grouse, sage grouse are this North America's largest upland grouse species. Uh, they're big and um, awkward looking, but 
really charismatic and emblematic of our sagebrush rangelands. Sagebrush rangelands are the largest terrestrial ecosystem in North America, about 186 million acres covering 11 western states and two Canadian provinces. Um, in 2010, they were pe petitioned to be listed under the Endangered Species Act because of long-term population declines. That was a turning point for us. We knew that if we didn't step up and try to bring some of these concepts to bear, that agriculture in general would be hamstrung in terms of uh, trying to be profitable and all of those things that we'd like to see. What I want to mention here is that scaling up this voluntary proactive conservation had to be based on an ecosystem approach. It wasn't just about the bird. Our tagline was sustainable uh, wildlife conservation through sustainable ranching. And that meant identifying some of the same issues here, these threats we call them, to the landscape were the same things that were imperiling our ability to sustain livestock operations across the West. That underlying vision of all of these activities was healthier and more resilient rangelands. That was the modifying factor that drove us. And there were a wide variety of threats being addressed across the West, but what we're going to focus on here today to give you that tangible example is the issue of wet meadow degradation. Sage grouse largely occupy upland uh, landscapes, really arid, semi-arid, less than 12 inches of precip a year type of rangelands. But in the summer, when everything else dries up, they really follow the green line, literally marching their little puffball chicks to these green grocery stores where they can fill up on insects and bugs. They're the last reservoirs of moisture in our uh, western landscapes. But years and years of uh, degradation and channel incision and a lot of other things happening has resulted in less resilient wet meadow and riparian areas that provide that reliable wet um, green grocery store. And so we're going to take this really nebulous and academic concept called resilience and we're going to make it real. We're going to show you something real that's happening and resulting in uh, something that benefits both wildlife and agriculture. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jim Cochran, who's going to introduce you to the Gunnison Basin. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm Jim Cochran. I'm a uh, rancher in uh, the Gunnison Basin, as stated. I'm also a wildlife biologist. I've, I've been practicing that field for about 44 years now. And uh, I've worked in two nations, literally from coast to coast, but I have finally was able to break free from ocean ranching and came back to the Gunnison Basin. I think we bought our place in 1993. So, been there for quite a while um, and had the opportunity to uh, start work on the Gunnison sage grouse, which is actually a, a separate species from the greater sage grouse, which uh, the Gunnison sage grouse is not the largest grouse species, the greater sage grouse is. So, but anyway, uh, to get to the story that, that we'd like to convey to you, um, we, the ranchers in the Gunnison Basin realized early on because the Gunnison sage grouse has been uh, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act uh, since the mid 1990s. They realized that they had to be proactive, not work to try to prevent a listing, but to do things to preclude the need to list a species. Work, what can we do? What, and, and the reason uh, the Gunnison Basin, uh, the ranchers can be impacted uh, by an endangered species or a proposed endangered species so significantly is the grouse uh, exists on public and private lands, but the ranching industry in the basin is very dependent, almost completely dependent on public land grazing for uh, the part of the year that are Hay meadows are in production to produce the feed for the winter. As an example, right now, I just talked to my wife. It's 23 degrees at our place, and we have six inches of snow on the ground since last night. 
uh, forage is gone, we're going to have to start feeding. So, and the basin, that's, that's the way it works. We're in eight to 9,000 feet. Uh, the cows are off, off the range and down on private land, down on the, on the harvested hay meadow. So, but anyway, uh, as, as a way to, I guess, to introduce this, um, our, this story really began in 2011 when the Nature Conservancy came to Gunnison and convened a climate adaption resiliency workshop. And you want to raise the antenna on a rancher, at least in our country, let a large environmental group come in that we haven't worked with and uh, what, why are these people here? What are they going to do to us? It isn't positive, we think. So I was also working as, as uh, I just started. Uh, well, I guess I started about six years previous, but I'd been asked by Gunnison County to, to develop a sage-grouse conservation program from a local government perspective. So we... We participated in the Nature Conservancy's workshop, which was primarily government agencies, some env local environmental groups, um, and it turned out it wasn't nearly as painful as we thought it was going to be. Um, TNC turned out to be a great partner in this uh, in the, in this context and this project, uh, but. As expected, through this this workshop and identifying um, uh, eco or ecosystems and species that were vulnerable, Gunnison sage grouse rose to the top once again, uh, as it always does in the Gunnison Basin. And the outcome of the workshop is well, um, we need to develop develop climate adaptation strategies. How do we build resiliency in our ecosystem? Well, I'm not very smart. I, I, my, my career has been spent uh, taking good ideas and implementing them. I'm not the guy that comes up with the ideas. I'm pretty good at implementing things. I said, what, what does a climate adaption strategy look like? I, I don't have a clue what it looks like. Well, as fate would have it, Nate uh, Seward, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, had been to a workshop uh, in the San Luis Valley, south of us, uh, put on by Bill Zedek. And it was, hey, we have lots, I mean, we've got literally thousands of incised watercourses in the basin. Why don't we take a look at what Bill's doing? We'd, we'd been trying over the years, the agencies uh, had tried to deal with these incised in, inside drainages in various ways. I mean, you can see old dozed up dams that BLM had built. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, was, was trying various techniques, uh, big stuff, heavy equipment, uh, Rocks. I mean, uh, you know, we're go we were going to solve the big problem. We were going to address the 20-foot deep gullies. So and so we invited Bill over uh, or up, and uh, the first one of the first photographs I have of the group that went out with Bill. We're standing in the bottom of a gully, and I'm over six feet tall, and the top of the gully is over my head, and Bill's kind of. Maybe, maybe not what we want to really work on. So, so that was the start of the process. Uh, we we worked through the winter. Uh, how do we put this together? I mean, some of the people that uh, I mean, you start talking. What's necessary? Bill's talking design. What's he's been doing down here in New Mexico? Uh, our thought was, let's see if this. If his kind of ideas, his techniques, work in a Gunnison Basin, it is, it is not New Mexico. I mean, we're we're a high arid basin. We get often a lot of snow. Um, so the next year, um, we were we identified a number of of 
potential sites that uh, could be a, that Bill felt that the, his techniques would work in. So what do we do next? Well, first of all, we couldn't go out on federal lands because NEPA wasn't done. There's no way to implement, start the program there. So let's start looking for private landowners. Well, you start doing that, it's kind of like trying to get the cow, the first cow into the alleyway. They're not gonna go very easy. And well, who's gonna be the first one to stick their head in and see if this is gonna hurt or not? And luckily we had, uh, we did had two sites on two different ranches um, that the landowners said, we'll give it a shot. And uh, we were able to get through the permitting. You have to go through Corps of Engineers permitting. I mean, you go through a lot of hoops. Then uh, we realized, well, we're gonna be working with volunteers on private lands. What's to protect the landowners? And somebody falls and hurts themselves. There were lots of hoops to deal with, but when we were done, we had two projects, uh, very successful projects. Um, and uh, we, I mean, one of the landowners, uh, he carried photographs of the structures we built around on his iPhone like he was carrying photographs of his baby. I mean, he was that proud of, of what had been done. He allowed us, I mean, his, the irrigation uh, to his ranch, a major shared ditch, uh, right after the hay came off the meadow, that was the best way to access uh, the project area. Went in, dug the ditch out, put a, put a land bridge, I mean, filled the ditch in so we could get dump trucks across the thing. We had to haul rocks, we had front end loaders. These are hand built structures, but they take a lot of material and it's heavy. And even though it's the Rocky Mountains, there, it doesn't make sense, at least in our area, to carry each, a rock from a quarter of a mile away to build a structure that takes 2,000 rocks or whatever. So, so anyway, we went from that. Once the landowners, the other ranchers, and the other landowners saw what was going on, it's become an easy sell now. And I just... Personally, one of, one of the ranches is right next to ours, so I was able to jump on a horse or get in the pickup and go over and see what was going on periodically. Shortly after we started that project in uh, September, early October, I went over. And here's a BLM hydrologist on a Saturday working with a volunteer crew on private land. I've never seen that before. That was... that. And that's continued throughout. And like I said, I've been in this business for over, I've been in a wildlife business for over 40 years. I've been in a ranching business my whole life. And I've never seen a collaborative uh, effort like this. We've got federal agencies uh, willing to fund projects where they legally can on private land, uh, not just NRCS, but the Forest Service, BLM, Colorado Parks and Wildlife jumped in with both feet, literally, and not only provided uh, Nate, who has become an expert in, in his own right as far as these, uh, doing these projects, but funding. So that's just my short story of, of this project. And just to say, I mean, it was done under the banner initially of Gunnison Sage Grouse Brood Rearing Habitat, but it, it benefits wildlife in general. It doesn't have to be done in Gunnison Sage Grouse Habitat. It can be done in any habitat where, you, where you've got uh, the need, the water, um, the, the package together. And from a rancher's standpoint, it's a no regrets strategy. Doesn't matter if climate change is gonna happen or not. Keeping water on the land, keeping water in the soil is, is important to a rancher. I mean, it drives me crazy when we have a, a cloudburst or a rain, rainstorm or snow melt and it all goes to California. That, that, that bothers me. 
I don't like that. I want it in, in my soil. I mean, that's where it's going to do some good. Let it bleed out slowly and go downstream. That's great. That's natural. So, so anyway, that's where I'm coming from. Nate's uh, uh, from the agency that, that um, is working both on public and private land and I think can add a lot to what, what has, he's been doing in, in recent times. Thank you, Jim. Well, I'm going to stand up. I kind of move around a little bit, but uh, I uh, want to borrow that term that Deborah used earlier, you know, a big tent. And that has definitely been one of the keys to our success in the Gunnison Basin. The numerous partners that you see listed up there on this slide, um, not just the, the, the typical federal agencies, BLM, Forest Service, we've been able to tap into our local university, uh, Western State Colorado University, uh, the Gunnison Conservation District, National Park Service, uh, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, Curry County Recreation Area. Those folks, we've been able to actually utilize some of the heavy equipment they have available to actually haul that rock that Jim mentioned you know, we're hauling into some of these degraded wet meadows. Um, I want to take a step back as well and use that term trust and credibility that Jeremy mentioned. Um, when I first started with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, I was in, immediately kind of thrown into a program called the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances Program, the CCAA. Now, many of you may be familiar with that program being a Fish and Wildlife Service program. But the state of Colorado decided we would step up and work with these private landowners, uh, really more of the, the ranchers, the larger uh, landowners in the Gunnison Basin, to help them enroll some of those lands and receive assurances that if the Gunnison sage grouse was listed for federal protection, they would have assurances on those enrolled lands that they would not have any future uh, restrictions. So in order to earn those assurances though, we would write up a conservation agreement or a certificate of inclusion and they would agree to voluntarily do some of these conservation measures like control noxious weeds, um, continue to do maintenance on their fences but maybe p tweak the fence design so it's uh, a wildlife friendlier fence design something of higher visibility so that grouse weren't colliding with those fences when they're moving from the, the uplands where they're roosting down to some of these hay meadows where they're breeding, uh, strutting the leks. And the private lands in the Gunnison Basin truly are critical. You know, a third of our leks are on those private lands. So there was, it's, it's a critical component of the overall conservation of Gunnison sage grouse. Uh-oh, I broke it. What did I do here? There we go. So what, the, what is the Gunnison sage grouse? Um, we've mentioned the greater sage grouse. The Gunnison sage grouse is roughly a third smaller in body size. Um, you can see Right here on the male, it's kind of difficult, but they have these specialized feathers called phyloplumes, which actually provide kind of a, a ponytail on the back of their head. Uh, higher contrast on the tail feathers, uh, more of that black and white versus, again, the, the greater sage grouse. Hens are pretty standard, very similar in, in size and in coloration. Uh, but again, the genetics we've shown, vocalizations are very different. As Jeremy mentioned, these green groceries, these wet meadows, mesic areas out there in the landscape, 90% uh, of different wildlife species need water during different parts of their life cycle. Uh, the Gunnison sage grouse is no different. And these are the areas that they're coming down to, again, because of the, the more lush vegetation, the diversity of forbs, which attract the insects. That helps provide the forage, the food, 
to really help them put on the body weight that they need for survival. Um, between 2005 to 2010, Colorado Parks and Wildlife actually conducted a demographic study where we found that chick survival really is that bottleneck. So what we're doing now is we're trying to implement these habitat enhancement projects on the ground, build this idea of resiliency in the landscape where we can hold moisture longer, keep these wet meadows saturated longer, uh, prolong the late season water flows, and hopefully provide that high quality uh, later brood during summer fall habitat that the bird needs. Again, Bill Z. Dyke, he's my mentor. Um, we tried initially some very expensive gabion check dam structures. Uh, some of these were about 100 to 120 feet in length, costing around $10,000. And I just had to keep asking myself over and over, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a simpler, easier way to come in and accomplish the same results, but not be so heavy handed, not coming in there with the bulldozer or a backhoe and digging up these uh, incised channels and putting on a large structure that's going to basically dam up the water behind it. So lucky enough, as Jim mentioned, I went to one of Bill Z. Dyke's workshops and discovered these techniques. And I'm curious, how, how many folks in the audience have actually had the opportunity to build a, a One Rock Dam here? That's great. So the One Rock Dam here is, right, it's, it's kind of the building block. It's, it's that critical structure that it slows the water down, it gets that pooling, it allows that water to then soak into the stream bank, resaturating that wet sponge that these wet meadows uh, create. We're seeing some great results. Um, you can see here some of the dandelions that are coming in. I, I call the dandelions ice cream food for, for sage grouse. It's just a very succulent plant that they enjoy. And uh, again, Doing these simple rock structures uh, in tandem, you can see the whole series here in this incised channel. Again, what we're doing is slowing that water down, uh, holding a little more moisture around the structure, allowing that grass to come in, which provides additional coarse, uh, coarse roughness, which slows the water down, but it also captures those fine clay particles and, and sediment, which allows it to settle out and eventually over time, we're gonna get that aggradation and we'll get that, uh, you know, the, the water level coming back and increasing over time. I really wanted to show this example. You can see here we have a one rock dam. We actually came back and added a second layer onto this, this structure, which allows the water here as the snow is melting off these upland hillsides, the water is coming down, but it's the structure is reconnected uh, that water to the floodplain now, and we're getting that water spread out and actually, I'll say, irrigating, for lack of a better word, uh, that wet meadow again. Spreading that water out again, we're getting the saturation that we need in rewetting that wet sponge. We have tried some other techniques other than just the simple rock structures. Uh, Bill, I know, is advocating more these days where possible the plug and spread treatment. Uh, this is a, a site where we actually came in with a small excavator and plugged that incised channel. And we were able to create a series of little pools here so that when the water is flowing, it gets captured, but then it's being reconnected in more of a, a natural sheet flow in these areas. Uh, we were so successful that following spring after installing these in the fall of 2016, we were literally drowning out the sagebrush in these areas that had encroached. So very successful project there. This is Michael Brown also with the Sage Grouse Initiative. This is that little pool uh, in the previous photo you can see. We've saturated that area where we actually had a tiger salamander come in and colonize it. So not only are these projects benefiting sage grouse, but numerous other species of wildlife, like amphibians. 
very briefly here, this is at our private ranch that Jim mentioned, one of our first uh, treatment sites. We experienced a drought in 2012 uh, from our transects being conducted. We had 30% cover of wetland species at that time. Uh, we went in the following, uh, following year, 2013, uh, built some of these rock structures. Uh, we added a second layer in 2016. We experienced a good winter in 1617, which provided a lot of snow melt, and that percentage of wetland plant species jumped up to 160%. Now this idea of resiliency, obviously this year was extremely dry an extreme drought. We wanted to go back and measure that same transect here and you can see I think we've been pretty successful in this area. Um, the willows have a lot more vigor. We still have quite a bit of uh, the herbaceous ground cover persisting. And so I would consider that a success as far as building this idea of resiliency in the landscape. So very quickly we had a very small ribbon of, the, of stream going through this wet meadow. In 2012, you can see a media luna here and some one rock dams being built. By 2018, I think the laser pointer just died. <laughs> uh, again, we were able to retain about 95% 90 of our wetland plant species in 2018 during that drought. Sage grouse are using these areas. This is actually a photo taken from a remote camera I set up to help monitor the wildlife use of these treatment sites. A different uh, treatment site, Chance Gulch, uh, again 2014. Here you can see the results, 17, looking pretty good, nice and green. 2018, even though it was a dry year, we still have some willow expansion. So, again, many different species of wildlife are benefiting from this work. Again, more results from Chance Gulch from our transects. I'll just let you look at those photos. Again, sage grouse are coming in and utilizing those succulent grasses and forbs that are uh, persisting in these areas now. Uh, the Sage Grouse Initiative actually came in June of 2017. We were able to train around 160 different private land biologists and collaborators uh, during what this workshop. Again, what we're doing is just getting, doing some outreach, getting the word out uh, on these techniques. And with that, I will hand the mic back over to Jeremy. Thanks, Nate. And uh, just to wrap up here, you know, part of what we've brought to the table that's new uh, with this effort is one, um, like Nate said, that workshop opportunity like you're doing here, coming together, getting people inspired, sharing ideas that work, and then they go back home and plant those seeds in their community. That's a huge key to getting a critical mass to do something about this. The other two pieces of the equation here that are really important to taking these kinds of things to scale is science to quantify the outcomes of what you've actually accomplished and the communications machine to tell your story because we're just not very good at that as, as land managers, conservationists, scientists, I would argue even ranchers. Um, so we've partnered up with the universities and one little nugget that I'll leave you with here on the science front. Um, we, we did a study here recently. There's actually this handout uh, on the NRCS table out in the hallway. It's a, just a two-page summary. I won't go into all the details. But essentially, we took advantage of satellites that have been going around the Earth, taking pictures of the land surface every 16 days since 1984. Um, it's called Landsat. We used that archive to take a look at three case studies around the West where these low-tech, sticks and stones approaches uh, and also some plain and simple uh, grazing management concepts have been applied to heal riparian and meadow systems. The upshot is we found that when you implemented these practices, 
Those areas became 25% more productive in their vegetation, and they stayed greener longer within the growing season. They did that because that sponge where all the water is flowing through is filling up instead of running off like a drain. And the ultimate take home is on after about 10 years of those practices being in place, that productivity was no longer sensitive to how much annual precip that area got. I'll say that again. That area was no longer sensitive to how much precip it got. The sponge was full. There was water in the piggy bank for the drought years. That's why we're seeing vegetation changes that are able to be resilient to drought. Those are the kinds of results we're after. Notice we're not talking about how many types of forbs are there for their sage grouse chicks. This is big picture stuff. This is what you're trying to do. Fix nutrient cycles. Fix the carbon cycle. Fix the hydrologic cycle. Those are the things that create a common shared vision and inspire the masses to go uh, regenerate the land. Thank you.